Hello, lore heads, and welcome to the League, exploring the League of Legends lore from A to Z. My name is Rebecca. And I'm John. My name is Mark. Today, we are going to be talking about Ruination, a League of Legends novel. This is by Anthony Reynolds. It is a full-length novel, 448 pages. It was published by Orbit Books on September 6, 2022. Yeah. You have 448? 448. That's what it's saying on GoReads. I don't know what... Let's see. I only got 410. <laughs> Ooh, we're missing some pages. You know what, it what is? is this? Me too. There's Maybe a lot it counts of, all of the extras. Yeah, like, there's a lot of maps in the back in the physical copies. There are little portraits of some of the characters. Um, so I think that's what's getting giving you the extra 38 pages. Yeah, um, so I'll say the... I mean, I don't... As far as this discussion goes and whatnot, I don't want to do like a full... A summary of everything that happens we could do like a quick I do. summary of it but just uh hands on the book the book's beautiful um the oh john's holding Here's it up the, to the, na- camera. the naked i like the naked more frankly the naked is better yeah, yeah and then the um the and that's the inside yeah and then the inside the jacket the inside of the jacket is also beautiful it has full artwork <laughs> just this is great audio content mm. <laughs> We'll put this up on Twitter if you guys want to see. YouTube's. Yeah, Twitter. Really great full artwork. And then in the back, there's like portraits of a lot of the characters. Mostly they're league champions. So if you play the game, you know what they look like anyway. But two of the characters are. Yeah. Plus, it's like Callista before she's a specter, right? Which you don't ever see anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's like a good example. And then. Thresh as well before he's yeah. become Thresh. And also, you get maps. <laughs> you get maps of uh, you get maps of some shit. You get, <laughs> you some get a map of Camelhor. I never found yeah. myself ever having to look at them, but it's appreciated. Right. <laughs> it always <laughs> seems like so. I don't know, not small or like in incon- Camelhor. The topology seemed inconsequential to the majority of the story. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it was like they it's felt true. it necessary for someone who just really had no... I mean, to be fair, I don't know anything about the geography of Camavor, and like I said, I never found it necessary or kind of important to ever reference that. So Yeah, I'll say I feel that way about most fantasy novels, and they also, most high fantasy novels come with maps. <laughs> it's so rare yeah. that I reference them. Uh, this book, I listened to the audiobook, by the way. John and Mark were the physical copy. The audiobook is a full full cast it's very cool there's occasionally like musical cues and stuff like that it's a great audiobook if you can find it um unfortunately my library didn't have it i ended up buying it (laughs) but it is very a couple of the voices did make me laugh a couple of times and then um the second half of the book i had to listen to it at twice the speed in order to finish it on time um so everyone sounded a little different but <laughs> but i think rise made me laugh because he's young in this right i don't know is he yeah. a teenager but Pretty he young. still kind of sounds like a grumpy old man <laughs> you know some people really? are just born grumpy old men <laughs> a little bit like uh, just a tiny bit and then hecarim's voice all right i'm gonna say just two words and it'll give you exactly you know exactly what voice this is sex bomb no no oh. Mm-hmm, yes. <laughs> and now you can kind of deduce what Heckram sounded like this entire, this kind of pompish British, pompish, pompous British accent sounding voice. Really, I was cracking up. I say, Callista, is there something like that? <laughs> yes. Oh, dear me. Yeah. <laughs> How <Huh>. droll. <laughs> Interesting. I really was interested to hear a little bit just to get a sense of you know how it like the musical cues is an interesting idea do you think that the heck room voice worked because it sounds to me a little like it didn't from what just, um, just trying to imagine that i think it worked for the character in the book i would say the character in the book did not work for me sure yeah <laughs> in general um yeah that w- that would be one of my iffies on this book but i guess um just to get our uh, first thoughts like did who who like liked overall. it? Who didn't? Yeah, overall. I mean, I liked it. Okay, John I didn't liked think it. it was perfect, but well, what is? I uh, this is. I feel like Anthony Reynolds was kind of put in a position where they were like, "Hey, we've got this story. It's been told <laughs> about three different times so far. <laughs> At least <laughs> we we need you to come up with a new way that's that's also different and better and." Maybe we'll make that canon. Um, and I liked a lot of the decisions he made. Uh, 
and I mean, I enjoyed reading it, uh, even, even knowing exactly where the story was going to go in the end. Um, I thought it was pretty neat. I, uh, yeah, I liked it. All right. Um, I kind of came down on the side of just not caring for it. It was a little bit of a struggle to like, I think it picks up in the back quarter, like the back third, back quarter of it. Uh, picked up and I was getting enjoying it more and I was kind of compelled to finish reading it at that point um, but getting into it at the start was really difficult for me and I don't know I don't know if I would have finished this I'll be honest with you if it were not you know within the context of we're going to read it and talk about it you know um, there are parts that I liked and there are characters that I spent enjoyed spending more time with and then there are just some things that didn't work for me I guess it's kind of my high level of it yeah, I'm. I feel like I'm kind of there. Um, the second half definitely worked better for me. Once uh, Callista um, made it back to Camivor yeah. after she had gone to the Blessed Isles, I think that's when the novel really started to pick up for me, and I really enjoyed most of what happened after that. But it was very slow to start. It's tough because I think if it weren't for this podcast, I would not have even picked up this book. This is not the story I would have chosen to read a full-length novel on in the League universe. Like, not even just... Yeah. We, we rip on Rise of the Sentinels and Viego. This just... When it comes to high fantasy these days, I'm kind of picky. I don't really like things about kings and thrones and princesses. They just don't appeal to me anymore. I also don't really like prequels. So everything was kind of working against <laughs> me sure. in this novel. I don't think it was bad at all. Um, it was just not my kind of story and the, it was so slow to open for me for sure yeah yeah so I, okay. as a super super quick overview mm. just in case you know nothing about this story or, i mean we're gonna be doing full spoilers obviously although i think you yeah. all know how it ends <laughs> <laughs> you all know how it ends so this this story is basically it it picks up um shortly before the incident where the incident the, the <laughs> incident uh, where he sold is poisoned and um, it carries along all the way up until the isle the blessed isles are officially ruined mm -hmm. ruined officially the shadow um, isles as named by rise it's like one of the last lines in the entire that fucking thing was so funny to me <laughs> right uh, <laughs> I would Anytime love something like that happens, it's just such a "We Are the Walking Dead" moment. It really <laughs> is. It was. I don't. I don't feel it was necessary as much as I did like the second half of the novel. Um, feeling the need to name everything so we all know how it got to be. Like we know why they probably started calling it the Shadow Isles. We didn't need Rise to be like. <laughs> These are the Shadow Isles now. <laughs> no longer the Blessed Isles. I would love it if he said something completely different. Hmm, <laughs> these are the spooky islands. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then just in the epilogue, they were like, uh, Rise tried calling them the spooky islands. But it's he not going to happen. Idiot. Stop trying to make it <laughs> we're happen, not doing Rise. That. <laughs> Big Dead Rocks didn't catch on, so... Uh... <laughs> Big Dead Rocks. <laughs> That's what I'm calling the Shadow Isles from now on. <laughs> the spooky Big Dead Rocks. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's what it covers. I mean, um, I know you've got a bunch of notes. I actually did go through and annotate some of mine, too, just to have pieces to kind of reference. John um, has so many tabs. We're in comparing our tabs, and John's is, has way more tabs than I do. <laughs> <laughs> got me tabbed out. Um, so I don't know. How, you, how did you want to tackle this? I kind of figured we would kind of pick through the story very quickly and then just kind of stop at things that we liked or didn't like. Sure. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm game. Sure. Um, you guys gotta go through your tabs one by one. Right. Yeah. I'm trying to, like, I will make say, not all my tabs are quality notes here. What? Um, <laughs> okay. I'm Yours? I'm flipping to my very first tab here, and the the note I have on it is, "What a fucking name." <laughs> This is oh. where we learn, I think the first place we learned Viego's full name. Oh, yeah. Which was Viego Santiarul Malak Valkala Haigari, which I'm sure the audiobook had a more accurate pronunciation of. <laughs> I don't which remember. Rebecca will do for you right now. No. Yep. <laughs> no, I will not. <laughs> yeah, Calissa's got an equally long ass fucking name. It's very uh, Akathia almost in that way. Yeah. I wonder sure. if it's. Uh, I wonder if it's kind of similar idea where it, it has to do with like where they come from, accolades, I mean, I don't probably know, shit like that. royalty and whatnot. Yeah, I'm sure something like that. 
you know i'm sure if we looked at the there's also a little family oh, tree oh yeah i was going to say let me look at the family tree oh, real yeah. quick i'm sure it's something like that like it could very well just be like father All grandfather right. name they, do, they don't like have that. their their full names here here you go leonor nope that's not in there <laughs> Camavilla, that's not in there. Okay, this is great content. What, yeah, o- what other thoughts do we have? <laughs> so I guess opening up. So, okay, here's something that I found myself kind of getting frustrated with, or, or a, a, a big thing that I did not like about this book is that the prose is very, I guess I would say pale. Is that a way, that, a word, a phrase that people say? Pale prose? Kind of like the inverse of, of purple prose? Like, <laughs> I don't know purple prose either, so. <laughs> um, so I guess what I would mean to say is that I found it often lacking uh like very vivid depictions or or like descriptions of things that was going on in the scene i found a lot of the time it was very uh this happened and then this happened and then Callista did this and then viego said that and there's not a mm. lot of like artistry for lack of a better word to really immerse me in the scene and the example i kind of pulled is so it's at the the assassination is is kind of happening and viego uses some magic to push Callista away and the way they kind of describe it is essentially just that Mm. I'm trying to find the, ex- the actual thing. She's pushed away, sliding and staggering by a force it was impossible to resist. When Callista regained her footing, she was easily 15 feet away. Um, and I uh, can't find it, but trying to beat on it, and it feels like hitting an invisible wall. And that's really it for the description of this thing. And they make a point in this little sequence, too, that this is the first time a monarch of Camavor has ever had magic. And on top of that, when Viego's getting into his moods and his emotions start to run hot, um, it makes the magic stronger. And they kind of feed on each other. So I feel like, wouldn't this be a really good time to really paint like a really vivid picture of what it feels like to be crushed underneath that like just raw force? Like Calista can barely get, like is choking out breaths because she's being crushed by this force that Viego is pushing against her. Or she's like thrown away like by, like a rag doll and just slams into something. It's just very like bare bones in terms of trying to depict this thing for me. And so the impact of, wow, Viego just used magic and that's this crazy thing. Um, it really falls f- a little flat in in my in my mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I'm with you. Uh, the common phrase often used, and that you get tired of hearing as a writer, is "show don't tell," and that gets frustrating because sometimes telling is very important and it's good and it has a place. Um, but in this case, I do feel like the opening in particular, um, when we're being introduced to everything and everyone, we're being told all of it and we're not really being shown anything. And I think that's why I really, I did struggle with the opening of this book for, for reasons that you're saying, Mark, for like that, for sure. I'm not, and, and it, it connects why like a bigger problem I had is that I never bought Callista and Viego's relationship at all. Um, they're supposed to be kind of close he is her uncle but she's older than him and she was a big sister figure something we're told but i never witnessed at all and i really don't feel a connection with them and that makes kind of the whole thing fall really flat in the end because if i'm not buying this strong connection that they have the betrayal and everything he does at the end doesn't hit as hard i mean i know it's going to happen anyway so that's also making it not (laughs) as hard but i i yeah that was something i really struggled with and i also really struggled with why Viego loves Isolde so much, I think I could I could get there, but we're given so little time with it. So little time. Mm-hmm. I like the idea that Viego is kind of becoming more cruel and Isolde is someone who pulled him back and that's a really kind of codependent and unhealthy thing and he becomes this really like emotionally abusive partner to her. And that's all great, but not shown very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I completely agree. That was that was kind of my other really big issue with it, and it's exactly in the intro, like you said. They're having to establish they're they're having to establish a lot, and on top of that, like you said, Viego, for being so pivotal, really is just there, kind of in the beginning and kind of in the end. Is sold is barely there at all because she's she's dead and dying for the most part. They try and give her a bit more with um, there's like two or Letters three journal entries yeah. of hers, and that's still not great because it's still just her saying Viego sees me as a prize, and it's like okay. Like you said, I'm open to that idea, uh, but you got to show it for it to feel authentic. And, and yeah, like you said, that relationship of it would really be nice to see Callista and Viego get along like once. There's a little introductory sh- scene where he's about to become or try to become king because you can die doing it, apparently. And yeah. Callista is reassuring him. And it's like, OK, that's the start. 
but it'd be nice to see some of the good times so we can see how far things have degraded by the end. And like you said, for the betrayal to land, because the, the Hecarim betrayal absolutely doesn't land whatsoever. Oh my God. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of silly. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. it is really, it's, it's, I laughed out loud, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's uh, like, well, yeah. really, the biggest betrayal that landed for me was Nuno, to be honest with you. Fucking neck crit <laughs> at it again. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was a, a big frustration point. It was funny. During that scene that you just referenced, too, where we do learn that that sword that Viego has is kind of a sword that all the kings in that line have. And you have to be chosen by the sword in order to become king. And if you're part of the bloodline and the sword does not choose you, it will just murder you. <laughs> um, which has happened, I, it sounds like. Which it's has not, happened, yeah. yeah. It's not unheard of. Um, and it made me wonder a few things. One, is this Riot's way of blaming Sentinels of Light on a sword that they also made up? Because the sword could have ended it right here. <laughs> the sword has to. terrible judgment. Yeah, and two, what are the qualities the sword is looking for? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, we're complaining about Viego, and I will always complain about Viego happily. But Viego, I thought he would be different at the beginning of this novel than the end. And I really feel like Viego is kind of the same. He does, in a way, quote, descent into madness. But I feel like he's already towing the line of madness right at the beginning of the novel. So, I, I don't know. It's tough, because most fantasies are not a standalone novel. And I really feel like it was tough to fit everything in here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you see a lot of that. So much. I think you see a lot of that with some of the world building stuff around, like, they kind of make some vague references to, like, there's a priesthood in Camavore that seems to have some sway. And, and they, they kind of got some ancestor kind of worship religion thing going on. <laughs> and the, the, the culture of, like, the nightly orders and like they call it like a questing culture well they 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 quote unquote quest out for for like artifacts but they really just use it to go fight wars it's like these are all ideas and they could all (laughs) really come into play but it's a 400 i mean it's a 400 page book that's like a really thin 400 pages it's very big in its font we were talking about this the other day so i feel like it's probably there's not that many words. It's 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 closer no. to Garen First Shield than it, than a it, novel. Yeah, I am curious what the word count is on it because I that's how I measure novel length is by word count more than page count as a writer myself. <laughs> and it doesn't feel like it's very long. This could have been a much longer book. I mean, I think you could have just made the small the font a little bit smaller <laughs> and it would have been the same amount of pages. Yeah, it is very big. Um, kind of like if you picked up a young adult novel, the font's usually a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. It feels like that. This could have been another one to 200 pages and I think it would have really filled out the relationships for me and Camivore for me and I, I it would have been so much more devastating because it is sad what happens to Callista in the end even though you know it's going to happen because I had kind of liked Callista by the <laughs> end of it because she had something of a character but I I didn't feel like she was upset about Viego I, I think I never understood why I could have even gotten by just her being really loyal to the crown and she doesn't have a relationship with Viego that would have worked even <laughs> for me but yeah, they yeah, try. They try and establish a lot of this idea that uh, the previous king on his deathbed had really kind of laid it on her. Like you have to keep Viego in line, and you have to make sure that Camavor is protected above all else. And it's something they kind of go back to sometimes. Yeah. So that's supposed to be part of it is that she's really weighted down by like her duties and senses of like almost a sense of guilt and like like she owes Viego to try and save him, and like there's some level of failure failure on her part. Um, that you know, it, like the thing is, like they, they kind, it kind of works in some instances, <laughs> but it just needs a little more time. And like you said, kind of really developing. You know, the thing too is that so much of this book is there's a lot of like, it's not action. There's a, like the first two thirds, there's not a lot of action going on. So it's like if you got all this interpersonal stuff and, and character stuff going on, like it, it really needs to, yeah. to fire. You know, it's a weird amount of like a- exposition and not even not world building, exposition. but. Um, <laughs> Like, to your point about, like, the whole, like, religious sect that seems to have a lot of power here and, like, the knightly orders, it's a lot of, like, setting up that type. But at the end of the day, like, the the religious sect you mentioned, it reminds me, I mean, not necessarily in what they're doing, but in terms of, like, the maybe the type of power they hold, like, it reminds me a lot of the mage seekers of Demacia. Um, and we don't actually have, like... It's not like there's a book about the Mage Seekers. Like, we learn about the Mage Seekers passively through, like, other champion stories and things like that. But I feel like 
I know way more about the mage seekers and their <laughs> impact on Demacia and like their machinations and their leadership mm -hmm. and all sorts of crazy details like that that I've picked up passively through other stories than I know about this kind of sect that's pulling a lot of strings within Camivore. And I just read a whole book about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that's the I'll thing, say, right? I, mean, I didn't I even remember <laughs> this religious group you're they, talking about. They really kind of fall out of the book after the, the kind of intro, you know, because it gets a lot of mention at the start. And then, I mean, Calista's gone from Camivore for at least the, uh, the good middle chunk of the book. And she comes back yeah. and doesn't really enter. And then they immediately leave anyway. So it's like, I think you had a really good point, Rebecca, when you said this feels like it could have gotten 200 more pages or if it was not a standalone thing. Um, it feels like it's not a standalone novel like and i guess arguably it kind of isn't because there's a bunch of other stories and lower yeah but um yeah. yeah i think you can make it work as a standalone novel standalone like high fantasy is getting more popular but the books are very long and i i think they might have just been worried um to publish a really long novel in, in this case um I was looking at a lot of reviews and ratings from people on Goodreads because I was kind of curious how this was going over with people. And in particular, I was trying to look at people who have know nothing about League of Legends and have read this book. And a lot of them kind of said the same thing that like, this stands on its own. You don't need to know anything about League. It's totally fine. I followed it completely. But it really pales in comparison to just other high fantasy that's coming out right now. It's just like, I think character-driven stuff is so big, <laughs> and this really is very character-driven. It's a plot-driven story, too, but it could have been even, like, way more character-driven. And, the, I mean, League, the best stories are character-driven, I think, the ones that they have. So, you know, the, fluffing up those really, you know, a lot of the problem I have with champion lore, right? I just want more connections, deeper connections with people. So you rip my heart out. <laughs> <laughs> when Viego turns on Callista and sends his army after her, that should have been a devastating moment. Like, a devastating. But I was like, oh, well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, yeah. oh God, hit my mic. I, I am curious. I, I would be curious to, like, somehow expunge all League information from my brain and read it. Because <laughs> um, it is it is really hard to judge things like that, things like Hecarim. Well, maybe not mm -hmm. Hecarim. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> It could potentially be difficult to or to judge those without like oh I just I just know what's going to happen I know where this is going how do I divorce that from my experience of it almost but yeah you know all right John you've been looking through your notes you got some more no I have no notes no oh shit <laughs> what do you want to <laughs> talk just faked about it. he's like I didn't think we'd actually talk about the book I just, I just, I just put it in post its just to <laughs> all the tabs are just personal <laughs> it's like a shopping list teehee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was gonna say that I like I like the view we get of Isolde here because I feel like we didn't we didn't necessarily get a lot of Isolde through any of the other stories, um, and I feel like the snippets we get of jour of her journals and also the snippets we get of Callista's letters to her, um, I thought actually did a pretty good job of fleshing out the type of person she is, um, which I like. I mean, she seems cool. <laughs> I, I would hang out with her, and it would be a shame if anything happened to her. <laughs> <laughs> then wouldn't that just be fucking terrible? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like he's old. Um, I like how they worked Gwen in here. She has, like, this doll. They, You know, her doll Gwen. And it made me wish that Gwen was different as a champion. <laughs> um, I just, because, like, I couldn't, the blue-haired anime girl, I just couldn't correlate with, like, this doll that she had made. And the idea that this doll takes a piece of her and that ultimately is what kills Viego, amazing. That's great. That's a great arc. But Gwen is so dumb. Just as a, like, as a, I'm so sorry. As a separate concept from this, very cute, right? Very fun. But as, like, this doll that is being clutched by this dying queen, just... And then who takes a piece of her when she dies and then annihilates her abusive husband. Oh, that's great. Not Gwen, though. Just looks real goofy. Can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. Can't do it, son. Can't, can't do I it. I can't do it. I'm sorry, Gwen. <laughs> now, sure. we get an interesting bit of information in this that I don't think we had gotten in any of the stories, yeah. um, which was that Callista was betrothed to Hecarim. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That was kind of new for this. Um, and we obviously, we know what type of person Hecarim is. <laughs> um, but I like, I'm, I'm curious if, if I didn't know that he was bad, I feel like I almost would have been more suspicious of him. But knowing that he went bad 
reading all his stuff, I was like, maybe they're going to make him not bad in this. <laughs> no. But, <laughs> really? but they, they made him bad. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. I, I want someone who, isn't, who doesn't know who Hecarim is to tell me, did you ever buy that this guy was leg- was good or legit? Because I feel like the moment he shows up, like, I, I I don't know. I never, I was trying to put myself in that position, and I, I never found myself thinking, like, I would ever buy that this guy is, le- is legit or that this guy isn't bad. You know what I mean? Like, red flags for me were kind of up, like, popping up consistently. Yeah. I don't know. Like, with... What do you all like? I don't know, what do you think, Rebecca? Yeah, I feel like I mean they made such a point to talk about the Iron Order in a way that showed you that the Iron Order was really brutal and cruel, and he's the one who leads them. So I feel like I kind of almost bought Callista, like maybe not understanding what the Iron Order was doing, and and kind of buying into some of it. I mean, she's like, I'm not gonna love this guy, but you know, I always knew my marriage was gonna be like a a keep the peace thing. So that's true. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I yeah, I definitely I wanted Hecarim to be more evil in a subtle way. Is kind of how I was feeling about him this entire book. I really Hecarim did not work for me <laughs> as a mm. character. I don't know why. I I wish I think I'd have to read it again to really pinpoint like what was off. It could have been the evil accent. <laughs> That is a hard one. Yeah, we didn't get the evil accent. See, maybe that colored yes. your perspective. I just, it was, it really, he My was lady. so evil. I need a parenthetical when he speaks the first time where they're like, imagine an evil accent here. And they'd be like, oh, okay, okay. okay. I uh, wish I okay. would have marked a part of the audiobook and I could just uh, play it for you. But I don't want to go through all nine hours of it to try to find Hecram speaking. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I- I, I agree. I feel like there was a lot of pains taken. Like there's these, that for at, at some point, Calista gets thrown in prison, and Hecarim shows up. Um, and at that point, they've already been kind of butting heads a lot. And I think it's hard to find any reason why she would ever trust him. They do try and make a lot of pains to be like he's explaining why he did what he did. Because at this point, he's gone out and you know pillaged and, and attacked and stuff while while Vie goes kind of absentee kinging. Um, and he does try and really <laughs> explain like, look, I did this because. He told me to, and if I didn't, this was going to happen. He spent all our money. I, I've got us a little bit of money. Like, really trying to say, like, look, there's a reason why I've done all these things that at the outset seem um, bad, right? And I think, again, if there was, like, an extra five to ten pages in some of these interactions where he could really convince at least Callista in universe, I would be a little more on board. But the guy shows up, and he's got a... He's just riding just an evil fucking horse. And it's really hard <laughs> at that point to be like, well... He seems cool. <laughs> it's, it, it, honestly, it sounds like it sounds like he rides up on that horse that you get from the Brotherhood in Skyrim. What is that show? <laughs> what is that horse's name? I was thinking, like, imagine a Disney <laughs> villain riding a horse, like Frollo's horse or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. From the Hunchback. It's something like that where it's just, this motherfucker is evil. That horse He's is fucking clearly evil. clearly evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. so, yeah, so it's, it's hard because I think the big thing we always at least I went into from thinking about the Callista story right is that she gets betrayed by Hecarim and at the time the moment of betrayal she trusts him is, is and that's why it's such like a oh wow I can't believe Hecarim did this shit but when it happens in the book it's like wow I can't believe she didn't think Hecarim would do that shit like <laughs> come on yeah I, it was a weird moment in the book for sure it was a very weird moment in the book for it to happen that whole that whole <laughs> section I was like wondering if they were gonna retcon the whole being stabbed a ton oh, of times. Oh, me too. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Same. Yeah, I definitely think they needed more of like a Frozen approach to this. <laughs> like Hans from Frozen where he's just like a genuinely sweet and nice guy and then in the end he stabs her in the back. That would have been great. But that he's clearly evil. <laughs> and I think the, uh, they even have a scene where he sees Ledros going into Callista's room and he's just lurking in the shadows, glaring at them. And I'm like, why is this in here? Like, <laughs> I, marked, I marked that. Cause it's, cause, okay, so before each POV character, they give a little symbol of like, ooh, this is Callista's helmet. This is Thresh's lantern. Ah, Thresh's that's cool. Lantern. Yeah, um, yeah that was and, pretty neat. And one of them is a little glaive and it's the only Hecker and POV we get and it's him seeing, like Ledros went to her room to give her the locket. They didn't like, there's nothing untoward and she actually kind of denies him but you're right Hecarim's just standing there in the darkness and talks about how like he's sitting there and he's just, like seething and his f- his fists like clench it's like that like Arthur just like oh he's <laughs> fucking Ledros <laughs> oh I it really it was it should not have been in there yeah I don't I don't know why it, it's I almost thought like oh is he going to 
try and use this in some sort of Machiavellian like thing. Ooh, um, that would have been more interesting. But it's not. He seems legitimately yeah. to think that they were just boinking, and he's like <laughs> mad. <laughs> Yeah, like, it would have been more interesting if he literally felt indifferent to it, and then yeah, like uh, or gleeful in a way that he could use this as leverage yeah, at some point. It, yes, here's a way that I feels can more true. help convince Viego, like turn Viego against you more, is because now mm-hmm. here's this seat, you know, like yeah, that would be more on brand with Hecarim because he's kind yeah. of a slime mm-hmm. ball. Be more Littlefinger. Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. For sure. Sure. Um. Uh, random note, but I would like yeah. Legends of Runeterra cards for all of the rest of the uh, host. I think that would be cool. The like the leaders of it, like uh, who was it, Lord Ordono and Lady Aurora. Are they the host leader or the other? That. Are they the other knightly order they were, leaders? They were the other knightly orders. Right. Mm. Okay. The the knightly orders, like again, that's a really cool concept, and it's like I wish there was a little more time to get into some of that because it's a neat idea. I like the idea of taking a like a really standard kind of fantasy almost it's all like camivore camelot right like very classic arthurian like concept or trope of we go out questing to go get the holy grail um but really it just means we're just going to go fuck up you know some place <laughs> and take all their shit like oh, that's a fun way to kind of turn it on its head um the host, it's okay because the know. religious order said that we could yeah you know. it's, it's 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 for god or something <laughs> sure yeah you can play into some crusades imagery and stuff you know there's a lot you can do with it right it's it's a it's a fun enough idea um but they don't really again yeah. they also kind of just fall out of the book they, they're they there in the start and then they're just kind of I forgot about them the too presumably yeah. they gave the blessing for sacking the, the blessed isles they seem but to be pretty okay actually. with <laughs> almost anything <laughs> any 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 sort of sacking related activities <laughs> sacking? they were pretty cool like sacking a, a, a city like, like putting your ball you know, sack I mean, it, um, like like teabagging <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go teabag the blessed like, isles <laughs> If you take over, uh, if you take over an area and you, uh, you know, steal all their shit, it's called sacking. Oh, I never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Fun factin'. Okay. I definitely was thinking like ball sacking, and then I was thinking oh. hacky sacking, and I was like, neither of these. I make mean, sense. in Terrible a way, combination. <laughs> g- taking over someone's country and then stealing all their shit is kind of like teabagging them. So I, I was going to say it's kind of like hacky sack. <laughs> it's like a really <laughs> aggressive version of it. <laughs> Uh, during one of these crusades, by the way, we get some fun item lore with the Mikhail's chalice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is much more powerful in this than in game. Has a lot more restorative powers. Sure. Yeah. I do like. That I mean, you know, they had to take it out of the game, didn't they? Yeah, yeah that's true. Oh no, Mikhail's it's still there, right? Crucible, I, I think, know. is in game. Yeah, yeah right? Crucible. Oh, that's right. Yeah. All right. So um, where are we at? All right, we have John's a, on page. We'll I'm on page 37. <laughs> okay, well, I'm on 106. It's fine. We're kind of bouncing around. It's not a big deal. Okay. Uh, there's a bit of foreshadowing here. Let me know if you guys catch it. Ooh, okay. I'm going to read you a quote. <clears throat> oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can tell you already. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, as she looked around her, the knights and nobles hardly looked like people at all. The unnatural glare from above leached their faces of color, making everyone appear as vile specters and ghouls. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I wonder what will happen to all, to, to, oh, at the goodness. end of this book. <laughs> uh, so we get a... We talked about how this is kind of another version of stories we've already heard oh, before. yeah. Um, but we do get a, a new telling, a brand new telling of how we sold got poisoned. <laughs> yeah. And finally, finally, it's one that makes sense to me mm-hmm. because we had talked about the other three, and they all didn't make sense for various reasons. One of them, one of them, uh, it looked like 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 Viego was dodging out of the way of a dagger to let Isolde get hit and then one of them it looked like Isolde was going out of her way to block the dagger for uh, Viego and um, none of this made a whole lot of sense to me but this one where it was aimed at Viego and then Callista managed to get it there just in time to deflect the dagger but not quite enough like deflected it but then it went into Isolde instead or like didn't go it into her but it her. grazed her and it was poison yeah. so it was enough like that 
I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I it- I like this is my this is my canon version of how this went down. Yeah, I mean it makes it, it's just uh it adds more angst to the situation, which I really like. Um and also, I liked the I like the scene in general. It is a good scene. It was the first scene that I really stuck to, except Urlock Grill shit, which <laughs> we haven't talked about him yet. Oh yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, Callis is really the main character in this book. There are some chapters that are from other people's point of views but it's mostly about Callista. so having Callista be the one responsible in a way indirectly for Isolde getting poisoned and dying like that's that's fucking brutal she was just trying to save Viego who sucks <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I do wish that they harped on that more um, something yes, else that I mentioned no, I agree and, completely mm-hmm. yeah because so it, so the, assass- the the incident happens they <laughs> They, they find, uh, again, this is also a change of the, the story we've heard around how they actually find the Blessed Isles, where I guess that says Viego sees it in a dream or a vision, um, but he does a bunch of research and kind of finds a spot on the map where this is a big blank spot that everyone goes around, which seems like something that everyone would know about. Hey, there's a spot in the middle Absolutely. of the ocean that's full of mist. Yeah, the, right. Like a giant wall of mist that we get confused in. Anyway, <laughs> but they're, they're on the well, ocean. our compasses stop working. <laughs> and it's super weird, right? That's weird. We I don't know. Don't... We shouldn't mark that on a map yeah. or anything. <laughs> no, don't put it on the map. Let's just avoid it. Let's just avoid it. Um, but so Callista goes out to go search for it, and she's on the ship for like two weeks. And it talks about how she's there, and you would think that the whole time she should would be really like racked with like stress. Like I'm leaving Viego alone. He was already kind of fraying at the seams. I don't know if a soul's gonna live another day. Who the fuck knows? But instead, she's like, at first, she's just kind of like, ooh, porpoises. And then she just gets kind of bored. <laughs> I feel like you should be a, like not sleeping very well. And it talks about how she, she makes one of the lower decks like a training area or something. No, no, she's above deck. Anyway, training area. And I would think that, oh, that would make sense that like you're just trying to take your mind off of this. And so you're just training to exhaustion so you can sleep. But instead, it's just sort of like, well, the ocean's fucking boring. So I'm going to do this, <laughs> I guess. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's true. Yeah. I don't know, it stuck out to me a little. Um, mm-hmm. Where it's like, it seems like something, I think a little later on, some, like the captain of Venix, right? Yeah. The, the otter, the stallion, kind of mentions like, oh, you don't know if it's old, still alive. And it's like, oh yeah, that's a fear that Callista also had. And it's like, <laughs> okay, that seems like that would be the main thing on her mind. I don't know. <laughs> Callista had also considered this once or twice over the past few weeks. <laughs> but it was yeah, stressful. It's... <laughs> I. It's like when you, imagine you get like a text when you're like out or doing something from like it's like we need to talk we need to talk yeah like (laughs) that's all you're gonna think about all day and then like a month later you know you know (laughs) yeah like (laughs) stress about that shit every day (laughs) yeah yeah i mean when she gets to the blessed isles you know when she asks you know permission to bring these old there they take their time answering her they take a few days and she's like freaking out the whole time like i gotta get back these all might not be alive and yeah you're right she should have had that energy <laughs> throughout yeah, the really entire nervous. thing i, I yeah. wish that was something yeah had been emphasizing the entire thing so by the time she's at the blessed isle she's at her wits her wits end and that's yeah she doesn't really like being there but i feel like if you kind of amplified that and had it going on from like way earlier by the time she's there you as the reader might be feeling the same thing like I, I just I want to get the fuck back and just know what's happening I might just leave without them telling me the answer because I don't know what's gonna like what's happening who the fuck knows what's happening in Camivore so yeah for sure now the next note I have is like around page 60 and this is kind of an example of how I was taking notes while I was reading <laughs> even if my thoughts resolved themselves later on mm. so I'll go over my next two notes but this is during the uh, Erlock Rail section whereas, many. whereas he's more commonly known in the league vernacular Thresh <laughs> I don't know why you uh, put that affectation on it but okay <laughs> uh, Thresh <laughs> um so this is the point where uh, someone named, um, hi- whoever his boss was, basically named Maxim, Maxime. Um, he kind of, yeah, he was, he, Thresh was up to some shady shit down there and was hiding a bunch of artifacts in his room after pilfering them, and his boss caught him. So Thresh kind of walks in on him, rifling through his room, and he's like, ah, ha, ha, your days are over. And then the next scene we get to, it's, um, you know, the the authorities essentially uh, banging on Thresh's door, like, uh, 
uh, you got to come with us. And my first thought immediately was like, for real, dude, you like, you let him just rat you out like that? Like you didn't just murder this guy? Like I thought for sure that you were just going to murder this guy. Um, and I was very confused. But then later on, we find out that he did actually, uh, you know, he did. I mean, he didn't murder him, but he like trapped him in a room and was torturing him. And the whole reason the authorities came was because that dude was like missing and they wanted to know if he knew anything. So it all came together. I, my <laughs> note says, ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> ah, release, finally. <laughs> I, I had the exact same thought process. Um, can I say, I, I fucking, all the Thresh stuff is really good. I was really, I really, so anytime, good. anytime I saw that lantern, I was like, oh man. <laughs> I'm, I'm super entertained because they're very. I think what it is for me is that um, Callista's a, not a bad character, but I do feel like there was a little bit of a struggle maybe to give her like a really strong voice when you're reading her, yeah. her passages. And she's the main character. Like, I think the vast bulk of the book is her. And so it's it's hard when there's not a lot of strong, uh, like, authorial, like, narrative voice going on. But when you're ever you're from Thresh's perspective, it's drenched in it and it's like oh yeah, yeah i totally get what this guy's about what his perspectives are he doesn't have to tell me that he's like a sadistic you know crazy little motherfucker because i just see it in the way he thinks and the way he does shit yeah you know? yeah it's w- w- well before he has someone locked up and he's torturing them <laughs> you know he is the kind of guy who would lock someone up and torture them yeah. and not because he says i'd love to lock someone up and torture them the voice actor for him was really great too i would have read an entire novel from Murlock Rail's point of view <laughs> yeah. i thought they were really fantastic and i didn't think i was going to get into it um the first chapter one of the first chapters is from and maybe it's the I first chapter the from first his one yeah. probably yeah yeah um and i thought it was good but i wasn't expecting to turn and i i like that that was the opening chapter it was setting up him being kind of a uh, sent underground nobody wants to uh mentor him is what it comes down to and you're getting this from his point of view so he's like ah they're all rich snobs and they just look down on me and they're kind of like you're fucked up yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like how they phrase it <laughs> like you need to go away yeah <laughs> like you should still work here but no one you, like you're too fucked up <laughs> and i <laughs> and, and i mean Erlock rail thresh is the one who it gets all of this this is all his fault i was gonna say that's one of the big changes in this like previous versions of the story all we hear is that a a warden led viego down to the fountain um but thresh in the story has way more agency than that like Mm -hmm. and it's intentional he's intentionally doing what he can to bring camivore here he's taking every opportunity he can to pull the strings he understands when he needs to use his brains. I like um, towards the end the scene he has when he realizes that Viego is actually very powerful. It's <laughs> it's such a good moment in the book when um, Viego you know uses his sword and he sees this magic and Thresh is like noted. Okay, <laughs> don't push those <laughs> I'm not, buttons. I'm not gonna be able to fight him. All right, <laughs> I'll, I'll use that. And he does use this to his advantage. And even in as much as we bitch about Rise of the Sentinels, Thresh being the one who comes out on top. That just gives it so much more weight, this book. Uh, he's great in this, <laughs> for sure. Totally agree. Yeah. It, absolutely fun to read. Frankly, um, it was a lot of fun seeing him with because Rise shows up. I know we're kind of bouncing around. Oh, yeah. I was really surprised, mm-hmm. not only that Rise shows up, but he's kind of a main, a, a big player. He's a yeah. POV character. And it, mm-hmm. for some time, the two of them kind of get into like a weird, I don't like you and you don't like me, but we kind of both can help each other type <laughs> situation. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of fun like just the tension of them two walking around in these dark caverns underneath the city and rise is not like really on board with it but he he's his ambition can't he can't help himself almost a little bit i really like yeah. those that whole those sequences were a lot of fun to read frankly yeah those those were great because rise has a lot of the same bitterness that erlock rail has where he's feeling underestimated and kind of left out in a lot of ways but in his case it's not because he's too fucked up it's just it's the relationship with his mentor which they kind of mend by the end of the book and and when rise realizes oh i don't want to be this guy holy shit no (laughs) (laughs) and like it adds another element to rises um mentoring brand or well i was gonna say his fear of the world runes oh because we kind of get the um you know we we always kind of get the his his mentor's hometown or something was kind of blown up by by the world rune and they hold too much power in the rune wars and all that 
but kind of the first instance, I guess, of his life interacting with one of these world runes, even though he probably didn't even know that <laughs> he was interacting with it. <laughs> um, was the was the rune at the the bottom of the 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 holy water the waters of life life water <laughs> the well of ages uh, I think is what they call um, it <laughs> but yeah seeing seeing what it can do you know puts puts a fear of God in you not o- and not, uh, not only that but the fact that he's kind of also responsible for oh yeah it absolutely. happening yeah. right. So it's a very immense kind of personal guilt. I'll be, yeah, I Which like it. Makes sense why he looks so tired in his cinematics <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of a lot of souls you're carrying with you, so especially is, for how old you are. I was gonna say, is the reason he's really old because he drank from the waters of life and it's probably extended his his vitality or some shit? No, well, probably that would make sense mm. more than like he's a magic man. So <laughs> I guess that could also make sense. But it is more interesting the idea that he drank water from the Blessed Isles. Oh, you know, before they were ruined. I would really now. I really want to see because he does interact with Callista a little bit, and in the end, Callista makes this massive sacrifice. And I really want to know. Does Rise know what Callista is now? Is he aware that she's this like vengeful spirit that you could summon? How does he feel about that? <laughs> I'd love a lot of Rise interactions with the characters in yes, the story. Yes, I agree. I'd love that yeah. they could add those in. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I, I completely agree. It, it would be very, it'd just be very interesting because it's this whole deep connection, really, that we never really knew about and is, I think, really only existed in the context of this story, right? Uh, but it's a very interesting one. It's also interesting because they don't really leave on like the best of terms. Like she doesn't really like him because yeah. he's kind of like an Anakin Skywalker type almost. Yeah, <laughs> he's just annoying. And then by the end of it, he knows that like oh she did this really, she did the big sacrifice, and uh, I'd never got a chance to thank her or even like really talk to her about it or anything like that. So again, just kind of putting more and more stones of guilt on his back almost. You know, mm-hmm. it's interesting too because in his line of work where he's just going around collecting stones, some of which probably guarded or owned by other people. There's a very real chance that uh, someone will be calling Callista on him at some point. <laughs> oh, that, that would be, be fascinating. so good. Oh my god, yeah. I would love that. Oh my mm-hmm. god, yes. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> fucking story idea, frankly. That oh, is man. a really great story idea. I mean, he's one of the few people who was still alive and knew Callista before she became what she is. He may be the only person who's who's still yeah, alive, actually, alive. Because right? yeah. there's probably it's probably just Ledros and other ghosts at this at this point. And other I think ghosties. of <laughs> ghosties. Yeah, I don't think we'll yeah, count Viego as alive. But. No. I put this note in upside down. Oh no! Oh shit! <laughs> Let's see. Oh, so there's a there's a passage from one of these chapters that says. Flit dragons fed on nectar with long tongues, wings humming. And from this description, we can kind of gather that flit dragons are essentially like hummingbirds here. So this is this is just a, a quick note for Cassante lore. Um, if you're going to give something normal a new name, describe it so we have context on what the hell you're trying to say. <laughs> Thank you. I guess that's fair. That is a fair. It's a fair point. Mm-mm. Him. Let's see what we got here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like this you rediscovering your notes. I know, thing. like especially these early ones. <laughs> this is uh this is gonna be a, a mythic quest deep cut for fans mm. of the shows. But this is this is referring to Viego um, when he did decide to uh, <laughs> to uh, make have that map made of. Um, all the all the ocean Uh yeah (laughs) he's like yeah yeah i just gathered i just gathered these hundreds of maps together and then i called the cartographer in (laughs) to just go through them and like and make this map did you know we had a cartographer (laughs) it had it had such a big calling the art team in on the weekend vibes (laughs) from (laughs) mythic quest yeah running joke in mythic quest is they have the art department whip things up quote unquote obviously nothing's whipped up it takes hours of labor (laughs) like oh yeah our team whipped it up real quick for us <laughs> it made me think of that bit where he's they're trying to get Ledros to be his new bodyguard and they're trying to figure out well only a noble can do it and Nuno his advisor is like well you can just make him a noble and he was like I can do that it's like aren't there laws it's like yeah you're king you can just do it I'll whip up the paperwork we'll be good to go uh, sign here so in the audiobook 
uh, his name is pronounced Nunyo. Oh, really? Which uh, all I could think was Nunyo. Nunyo business. business. <laughs> Every time they fucking wow. said it. Okay. Nunyo. <laughs> Talking about Nunyo, what do y'all think about Nunyo being like an actual like bad guy at the end of it all? I mean, I I like I, I like it because the 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 big thing is that Nunyo did what Callista almost couldn't i guess callista was promised to or her her job was to protect the crown or like protect camivore above all else and she felt like the best way to do that was to uh, back up um viego and protect viego but like viego's the reason that all of camivore (laughs) was going down the drain and he had drained the coffers and there was no money to pay for anything and I can see from like from Nunyo's perspective, as someone who wants Camivore to continue existing, yeah, pillaging this place that's just full of gold and has no defense, like I can see how that would make a lot of sense, especially, you know, if you knew that your king was gonna be leading the charge and there was every every chance that he was gonna die doing it and Hecarim <laughs> would take over. Mm-hmm. From Nunyo's perspective, that makes total sense to me. Like, <laughs> that's how you fix Camivore. That may be the only way to fix Camivore. <laughs> it's an interesting idea, um, and you see hints of it around him. Like, there are moments where Callista... Like, there's at least one scene where Callista walks in on him and Hecarim talking about, like, okay, what do we do if this shit doesn't fucking work and we and Viego's a problem? Um, it's it's an interesting one. It's I found it a little He's more... a worm, for sure. <laughs> it, it worked. It worked better, maybe, than like the Hecker and betrayal because I didn't necessarily see it coming. But I looked back and I was like, "Well, he is." There are moments where he will like do things that seem like it's kind of making things worse. Like he's kind of egging Viego on, and it's like, "Why is he doing that?" I was like, "Okay, it's because he's kind of trying to drive him to this point, you know that." And he's got this very clear sort of fascination with these magical artifacts that you know the Blessed Isles obviously have. So it's like I can see him both, like you described, having this kind of. Um, ruthless political sort of perspective on it but then also like a personal like i i want to see what they've got in those fucking vaults and i would i kind of i can personally benefit from doing this <laughs> so this is it was an interesting turn i didn't really expect it i'll say yeah yeah he's he struck me as like a less clever thresh like he, <laughs> he still had schemes and machinations but like um, didn't have to work nearly as hard for his. I'm gonna be honest. I kept forgetting about him, and then whenever they said Nunyo, I would be like Nunyo business, and then I never had any idea what they said after that because I was so distracted. <laughs> Maybe they should have so gone with I, a different pronunciation. I missed a lot of the Nunyo stuff. Oh. I'm gonna be honest. No I do kind of want to go back and replay those sections of the Ruined King. King. Yeah. That was because my like big... I know that he was Is like Nunyo in it. Nunyo, yeah, yeah. Necrit's in it. Um. That's Necrit? Yeah, Nunyo Necrit's is. Oh my god. <laughs> um, but in the Ruined King, he like he Did helps you out. Did it say his out. full name a lot? No, no, I think maybe once or twice. Oh, okay, yeah. I must have missed it when I was. I'm always like taking care of like my baby when I'm listening to an audiobook. <laughs> oh, it's it That's how I read oh, books I've these days. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. The only so one just here with the baby. babies, okay? <laughs> yeah, some of you all have wives that take care of your babies all day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so he's your help she's like he's your helper in the ruined king he gives you a ton of information and i'm trying to remember if there's like a section where he talks about regret for his part in the ruination so or alive? not Probably. i mean no he's like a oh, okay everyone he's on the like, shadow isles he's just kind of yeah, a wraith yeah, but okay. but he's like he still has sentience on like a lot of the yeah shadow so isle wraiths yeah. and like you said he does he is pivotal to that team succeeding eventually um it's a it made me want to go back and see that too because i feel like he probably yeah. he probably doesn't and it's probably just this was this is was added later right before that game came out <laughs> but i don't know maybe it was something that i kind of glossed over or missed and just kind of assumed like oh who knows what what old necrit's talking about i was probably very distracted like <laughs> hey look it's necrit hey look at that necrit <laughs> ah he's a ghost <laughs> So. <laughs> it, was, it was just surprising that this <laughs> little side kind of i want to say joke character i thought he was going to show up at the start and like just as this kind of like beleaguered almost merlin type like the house magician and then would never show up again rather than being like really pivotal to the fucking events of the story it was, it was weird <laughs> that's why they they did it <laughs> yeah you never saw it coming yeah they're like well they they're, anthony was like they're gonna know about hecarim and all that <laughs> it's true catch them off guard yeah. Now, shall we 
shall we go over what in my head I dubbed as the the Yasuo Island, which if you've played uh, The Ruined King, you'll probably uh, know the reference. Yeah. But um, the, the, the side quest that they go on before going to the Shadow Isles that probably didn't need to be in the book anyway, Is this the but st- was the just Soraka? an opportunity to introduce... <laughs> Soraka. Oh my god, I forgot. Yes. And introducing <laughs> Clan Pharos. Um, yeah. Pre, for the record, this this all takes place not only pre Tilt Over Zon, but even pre Bilgewater. Yeah. Um, but they introduce a member of uh, Clan Pharos, pre Clan Pharos days. Um, and they introduce uh, Soraka. Yeah. Well, I guess talking about it, I thought I, I kind of agree. It probably didn't need to be in the book because, like, it feels like it's kind of waiting, like wasting time. It's just kind of like spinning its wheels a bit. The context is Callista. Yeah. They've hit a brick wall. They can't get through the mist, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And they know, and Callista kind of deduces, "Oh, well, there's this, there's this port called Buru, um, and maybe we can find more information there. Some voyage was went there." Um, and they don't find a guide, and eventually they get the deal with the Pharos guy, who leads them to Soraka, who's like a seer, and kind of, and, and then just gives like a cryptic message, and then they get betrayed, and there's like a tiny action sequence. I guess to me it was like the biggest issue that I had with it is that when you have to introduce like a vision or like a dream or like a soothsayer, or like a seer to come in and help your character find the plot, it's like. Mm. There's not like a better way. Like Callista couldn't have done something to find the plot. You just kind of yeah. had to kind of reach in. And, I agree. You know. The worst part to me is that she did. Like if if they had seen the ship that was being attacked, and then Callista was like, "Wait a minute, that masthead is what Soraka told me to look out for. Let's go save them." Yeah, it makes sense. Maybe maybe you need the vision, but she didn't. The her captain was like, "Oh no, we can't." we can't interrupt there. They're being attacked. They're probably dead. We're fine. And Callista was like, no, I don't care what happens. We're going to go save them. And she was going to save that ship regardless. She didn't even know that it was the ship with the masthead on it. She was already going there. She was already rescuing them and like was already going to meet the people that were going to set this entire thing into motion. Like the, the whole vision was just like, you know, her, her little Vestaya companion was like, oh, hey, there's that, there's that thing that Soraka said <laughs> on the ship that we're already on because we rescued it without having seen it first. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, really uh, super frustrating. And it's extra frustrating because we talked a lot about ways that we needed this to be beefed up a little bit more to connect with the characters. And then we get this Soraka chapter, which I genuinely forgot about <laughs> until you brought it up because it has no importance at all to the plot maybe if Soraka had come back in some way why does she it does she want the is it just destiny that the blessed isles are going to become the shadow isles i'm sorry the dead rocks <laughs> the big dead rocks <laughs> the big dead rocks uh why is she leading callista here i it's a good question cuz she presents it to callista as like you have a choice you cannot do this and you can just go live your life and be happy if you just fucking leave and on top of that soraka's like well you know someday this is going to be bilgewater she didn't say it outright but I was like and that sucks cuz bilgewater is going to suck ass it's going to be a place going to be like a tanker store of murder That's a and, quote. and yeah it's actually from, from page 189 bilgewater is going to suck, suck ass, ass at soraka <laughs> <It's gonna suck. laughs> You know, I don't know what Soraka's deal is, to be honest with you. Um, maybe she's sort of like, a, she's just very impartial and amoral, almost. Just like, I just tell it how it is and let people decide. But it seems weird, because it seems like she doesn't want Bilgewater to be there. And maybe Callista not doing this shit will change that. But I don't know. You know? Or maybe Bilgewater would suck less ass if it wasn't attacked by wraiths every fucking three months or whatever. It would probably help. It would have to help, right? <laughs> I think so. I think it would have helped a lot. You know what another frustration is? So this I had? is all Soraka's fault. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. We can really... It's, we should just keep tracing the blame back and find whose fault it really originally is. It's probably some Camavoran, I'm going to guess. But, you know, you never probably. know. Um, another complaint I have with that is that they get betrayed by the Pharaoh's guy. He takes Callista and... Uh, holy shit, I forgot her name. Venix? Is it Fennec? Was it Fezix? The problem is I'm thinking of Vernix, got- which is that shit that's on babies when they're first born. <laughs> Venix. Venix. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> She's got cream cheese all over. Mm. But um, they get they get betrayed and they kind of t- he 
Clan Pharaoh's guy takes him prisoner, and the whole thing is resolved in like four pages. Um, it's it's such a, sh- a little brief hiccup of like a, a, f- a complication. It's like why even do it, or why not, or, or rather than that, why not like spend more time with it? So there's like there's like some tension around what's going to happen, how they're going to get out of it. Um, it's just like they're captured, they're like captured, and then they're free, like in the span of me turning yeah. the page. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I I had also forgotten about the betrayal because it's so <laughs> quick. The only thing I can think of is one, maybe they needed some kind of action scene because it had to happen. They were feeling pressure to put a little bit more action. I don't think that's necessary, but I understand kind of feeling like that when you're making a high fantasy. Or they wanted to highlight it, various ways in which Callista is being portrayed in her life. Because um, at the end of the novel, I mean, she does turn into this vengeful wraith, which I also didn't love how that happened. Um, we could talk about that when we get more towards <laughs> the end of the book, but I, I really didn't feel a lot of the portrayal that she was talking about. I mean, because the Hecarim betrayal was so laughingly obvious. <laughs> um, and then the other ones are things that we haven't seen except this one little area, which like, I, I, I don't know, is this really that, is that much of a mar on your soul, Callista? The stranger this, that you trusted betrayed you for money or whatever? guy R- who no right, one this, trusted this at any markedly point. untrustworthy dude. Yeah, so I, I, my, I, think, I think what they were trying to do is surround Callista with betrayal, <laughs> is my thought, but I, I, it was wildly unnecessary. Yeah. I think more time could have been spent on things that we talked about her, rela- or, you know, Diego's relationship with Isolde and Sure. And I think to, to your like point that. about, like, pacing, because um, we go right from that to another action sequence where they're saving the ship that we oh, have yeah, been talking right. about. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like both, both that piece, I think, in turn suffers because it's also very short. Again, it's like four pages of them fighting these, like, mer people and it, from, like, when it starts to when it's resolved. It's like maybe Which that could have been very cool. That had a lot of potential as a cool fight. There's a lot of imagery. Like maybe just that can all be the mer people fight, or it can all be the betrayal if you <laughs> want to do go that yeah. route. Um, to yeah. see it some more time. I think that was yeah. So yeah, I um, think they just wanted the betrayal around her at all at all turns. Hmm. Little cocoon, <laughs> <laughs> cocoon of doom. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sequel to Cocoon. <laughs> Let's see. My next note is for page 220. Do you have one before that, Mark? Um, I don't know. I don't want to keep harping on it. I was a little frustrated <laughs> that when she they go to save that ship that the captain acquiesced. In, like, they have a, like two or three lines back and forth before Venix is like, okay, we'll go save them. When Venix seems really convinced that if we go deal with these things, we're going to fucking die. We need to get away as soon as possible. And then afterwards, Venix is sort of like, well, yeah, you were right, Callista. It shames me that I was so dishonorable. It's like, I don't know. She kind of, like, Venix always struck me as, like, a really practical, like, you know, down-to-earth otter person. And she shouldn't be so (laughs) willing to, like, she shouldn't give a shit about honor. You know, it doesn't matter. Honor matters to only when you're dead. I don't know, something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Seems, whatever. <clears throat> if if your life is at sea, I imagine you you deal you make a lot more really tough decisions based on practicality than yeah. someone in Callista's situation might as royalty. Yeah. yeah, I wish more time would have been spent on her character because especially she's one of the few who survives the ruination. And, and I liked her. I, I yeah, I did I like what was here for sure. Yeah, so I fun. definitely wanted more time with her and more time to flesh out the character. It was interesting to have a Vestian, which I wasn't expecting, and yeah, she was a, a cool little character who ended up being kind of important later. I mean, she's contributing to um, expanding the Sentinels, which is you know i'm important (laughs) i guess (laughs) so my note actually the one that i mentioned on page 220 when they first get to the island we we meet um i forget her name already um she's also in the back hold on let me look for her picture here you're talking about the scent the artificer is that you're talking about yes okay yeah agenda ka oh i think that sounds right that sounds right Jenda um, Kaya, yeah. Jenda Kaya, nice. I was close. Um, so she mentions being being like a, a sentinel of this area for some fucking reason. Did not even click in my mind that it was like that sentinel. <laughs> really? Until like until she started showing her like uh, oh, the blacksmith where they were making the sentinel <laughs> weapons. I was like, oh, sentinel. <laughs> 
Sand. <laughs> it wasn't capitalized. Was the problem? <laughs> which, as I'm looking at it, no, it is. Capitalized. I was gonna say it was capitalized. <laughs> You know what? That's just like your brain protecting itself. Uh, See Sentinels and like there's just a yeah, blank spot really, on the page. You're like, I'm enjoying myself. I don't I don't want to think about the Let's Sentinels. Think about that. Yeah. <laughs> also, fun fact about me and this forge on the 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 Shadow Isles going here in the Ruined King took me so fucking long to find this forge. Could not find this for the life of me. I, I don't even remember. I assume this is the same forge. I assume there's only one forge. <laughs> they got the one forge. I don't they know. got the, and that's all you need. I don't even remember it, to be honest with you. So, hmm, let's see. What did y'all think of uh, the artificer whose name I've already forgotten? Uh, Jendakaya. Yeah. Um, she's another one that I. <sighs> very friendly. She was very friendly. <laughs> I wanted naturally friendly. Again, I needed more time with her. Again, specifically, she's not a champion, so Jendikai is a new character, and uh, you know, I'm gonna need a little bit more time with that. You know, we understand that as a sentinel, she's gonna be very important. Where I assumed she was going to survive because the sentinels have to survive <laughs> in some way. But if I were a reader, it, it, like who didn't know anything about League, I think this would have caught me really off guard mm-hmm. because it didn't it didn't feel very important in the moment. It, it, I only knew it was important, and so it felt yeah a little bit more important. Yeah, she got I mean, very attached to Callista very quickly. That's kind of my almost yeah, frustration yeah. with it. Uh, it it, yeah. it feels like a hallmark of uh, some fan fiction writing. It's like everyone just kind of likes <laughs> Callista, right? Jindakaya, yeah. apropos nothing, just starts talking to... Like, she's this outsider and just starts kind of talking. And I get that she... Buck, like, Jindakaya sort of bucks tradition and is kind of a... She doesn't go along with what the, all the other Hellions, Blessed Isle folk say. But it is where she just kind of sits down and just like, hey, do you want to hear about some cool relic weapons that I'm fucking making? <laughs> um, yeah, you're totally right. Like, like they, they were another like... Another kid with her Pokemon cards. <laughs> Tyrus is like they that, needed- too. Honestly. He is, yeah. But they needed to talk about the Sentinel weapons, and it was like uh, he didn't know how to approach it, really. And I, I think maybe Callista is wandering. She's trying to kill time. Is there a way she could have come across a Sentinel weapon on her own? I imagine these aren't super locked up, are they? I don't remember, because it's not like they're super important yet. So having her be able to pick one up and have it fire in a way or something like that, I think you could have gotten Jen Nakaya's attention very quickly and gotten the backstory of these these weapons and, and why they're so important. That would have been nice. Yeah, yeah because Callista being, even if she couldn't completely fire it, you know, <laughs> because that would be a little too easy, but if she could have made it work in some way, that, that people would take a really long time. Although they keep saying that, it takes forever, but Callista manages to work one very quickly. Is it Rise who manages to work? Venix. No, who is it? Venix picks one up and can work it right away. Lucian and his story also, <laughs> picks um, up a Sentinel weapon and can work it right away. I think a lot of the technology behind that is probably what makes the Keystone type thing work yeah. too and Necrit just picked that shit up immediately too like it <laughs> yeah maybe it's it, maybe she's really hyping it up oh this is really hard it takes maybe she's just really bad at it and everyone else is like <laughs> oh no it seems pretty easy <laughs> and Senna too because Senna also was like, <laughs> they just weren't very good at these sentinel weapons you know what this is making me think of um so at some point Rise and, and Grail um get into the the waters of life or whatever and Rise steals some for Grail and Rise starts being kind of like haunted by this like specter that oh, he yeah. saw down in there and there's a bit where Rise kind of runs into Callista and Jindakaya and out, out, it just they're out at night and the specter's after him and it's this tiny little tiny little sequence like resolved in a page where they just shoot the, the specter and I feel like maybe that could have been a good incident where everyone kind of meets and you know in, in the scuffle the, the relic weapon gets dropped Jindakaya gets knocked out or something and Callista has to like desperately is like trying to get it to work and does finally and that's how they're kind of introduced like maybe the sentinels do kind of operate just in the shadows like the threshers almost i don't know there's a lot mm, maybe something like that i like that I don't know. yeah that would have made a lot more sense to me yeah because oh god now that i'm really thinking about jenna kai sitting down and be like i'm a sentinel would you like to see my relic weapons <laughs> like it was just, oh, it's just so uh, like uh, i wonder if these will be important your later in the story better <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah hi i'm a plot point and i have plot points would you like to see my plot points yeah, yeah. that's that's i think that that nails it that's that's what was kind of frustrating me about it um i was just curious because i had that sense i want to know what y'all thought 
but it's <laughs> fine. I don't know. So All right. This is this is unrelated to that. Okay. This, we're at page 280, 288 now for me. <clears throat> All right. Um, I feel like shorter. something that something that this book does that I don't think is done um, in the Viego stories or the stories surrounding Viego is like I I feel like it really hones in on the fact that um, Viego is not like a <clears throat> um, just like kind of like a, a petulant uh, child king who wants his wife back like there's like real mental illness here that they're uh, dipping their toe into but not committing to really mm. um, mm. but I, I definitely like it It makes me I don't know it makes me it makes me not hate Viego quite as much because the whole like <laughs> petulant king child and I will burn mm. everything to get my queen back type thing um, never felt great um, but you know the the idea of like a, a a king's like mind kind of unraveling and uh, kind of anchoring on to the one thing that kind of was centering him um, I can buy that more <laughs> yeah I, 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 doesn't I found, make me like Viego <laughs> personally anymore but I could buy the motivation more I, I kind of agree I, I so far and I'll be curious to see how I feel once we actually get to him um, so far Riot has not really sold me on the the portrayal of Viego as someone who didn't actually love this old and saw her more as like a possession I understand that's an idea that they've pushed and I think it, it absolutely could work and be, could be a nice sort of uh, twist on what seems like a very sympathetic villain but they haven't they haven't they haven't they haven't sold me on it yet is the only way I can describe it he, and, he still and in com- fact go ahead they, they seem to be doing the opposite like there are several points mm-hmm. even of of Isolde's journal where she's specifically like no it wasn't like this like at the beginning this was great like loving is great and like obviously he has a temper but like you know it was a great relationship and I think they specifically say like the few months leading up to when he sold did end up getting poisoned was like really when all the trouble started happening um, I mean I mean it's I think it has all the ground I mean all the flags for an abusive relationship yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. really what it was is Viego was very emotionally abusive towards her and uh, more often than not those relationships do start out really really nice and happy and then he's clinging to her um, I think leaning into that more would have been good it's really hard to read stuff like that but him trying to maybe um, separate Isolde from people, other people who care about her Mm-hmm. Sure. I think that's yeah. another thing that we kind of almost get. She doesn't really have any family. Um, she is close to Callista, which I don't know if that worked for me or not. But I, there's like a moment where she wants a friend with her and she's not feeling well and they bring her a doll. And like, that's very sad. <laughs> that's like her closest <laughs> friend is a little doll that she made because she's just so separated from everyone she's ever known in her life. So... Yeah, I, I think that's... I buy that a lot more with Viego than just seeing he's old as just a possession. I, I think he does love her. Um, but he's abusive and he loves but he's in his he's very way. abusive <laughs> and codependent and toxic. And <laughs> yeah. And spoiler alert for the video game, The Ruined King. But, I mean, that's kind of how you beat Viego at the end of the game is you're given intel that like this fairy tale romance that he's been selling throughout the whole game mm. is an illusion that he's created mm. and you kind of you have memories of um him as he's like seeing Isolde and like the impact that his actions are having on Isolde and he's like yelling at her and all this shit and mm. like mm-hmm. you're you're presenting him with these memories and like hey your whole shit's a lie <laughs> you know that right <laughs> I think I think you kind of said it best, Rebecca. Like, the, the it's all there. The groundwork is all there, right? I, what I want is like a couple more scenes of them together, kind of showing yeah. how the the way that things have progressed and the layers get pulled back on him. And I want like three more journal entries of his soul. It's kind of seeing her going from the start of it to the end and realizing this is not okay. I, I can't do this. You know, like that's that, that would be really that would is what I need to get it to work for me. I'll say. Um, and plus, another interesting kind of thing is that, like, 
I don't know if this was established anywhere else, but the fact that Camavor, that she's from some nation that Camavor invaded and just like completely took over, and this weird yeah. power kind of dynamic between the two of them. There's a lot of mm-hmm. fertile ground there too that I think they they, they touch on in the here, but I'd like to see it get more play in that that yeah. relationship. So, mm-hmm. especially agree. because it's not like. <clears throat> You know, it's not like they took over this area and then she was nobility in that area that they married. Like, she was... I mean, that would already have a power dynamic, but she was just, like, a commoner in this area. So that's even... That's way more of <laughs> of that in play. Yeah. Yeah. Frankly, that's why I'm always a little, like... it's It, it, it almost makes it harder for me to believe that she's so... Because they describe her a lot as, like, being very politically savvy. Like, she works the court real well and, she, and she's really beloved by the people which could happen but it's hard to imagine someone who was just like this kind of just low lowborn seamstress who got pulled into this like world and is very adept at, at handling it now maybe that's like she just found her she's found that she discovered she was good at it and that can work um, this is the thing where I was like we just need more time with assault we need more time yeah. with her not mm-hmm. as a fucking corpse <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> uh. So. Um, speaking of Isold and a corpse, <laughs> my next note here. Uh, so there's this chapter opens um, and says, uh, Viego went back and gently gathered up his dead wife in his arms. Yeah, like, I put a note that, like, come on, she has a name, okay? <laughs> it's Rich Girl with the Dead Parent. <laughs> God. <laughs> Little players throw back there. <laughs> Um, so we skip back one of my favorite parts of the book and it's when Callista returns to Camelot. Oh, fuck yeah. After getting she gets her no from the Blessed Isles and this slow realization that Isolde is dead <laughs> um, <laughs> and that Viego's in denial of this and everyone around him is just kind of silently like yeah maybe uh <laughs> get well soon man <laughs> like, I don't really know what to say and because I didn't I, I didn't know if she was going to be alive or not because I think this could have gone either way I think there are there are tellings where she had died already or she was still really sick when she was put in the the waters right I think she was mostly dead in all of them but the degree of dead very <laughs> the degree of dead okay. in one of them she had maggots <laughs> on her and the other one true. she was preserved with magic, the magic she's slightly yeah. preserved with magic here she's got the macaws right um, yeah, this was fantastic. Just the, like, she's smelling decay as she gets there, but at the same time, it sounds like Isolde is still alive. And she gets in the room, and she's like, this bitch is not alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, this, she is very dead and has been dead for a long time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You yeah. know, Oh, it's so good. I complain a bit about some of the descriptions being a little sparse, but this was one of the ones that really worked. And I think it's like, oh, the yeah. author's like pulling in like the senses, right? This, the first thing that hits is like the smell and they're trying to cover it up with like heavy incense, but you can still like that stink <laughs> mm-hmm. that just kind of runs under it. And she's like the whole sequence of her coming to, like into the city. Um, and it's just like fucking chaos. She's going through the palace and it's like there's yeah. rotting food. There's riots and just like open like kind of gang warfare in the streets i don't know and the guards are, it's it's great it's like wow this place has gone to fucking shit it's a great kind of reveal and I, again i wish she had been a, had it more on her mind coming into it like oh, i wonder what camo yeah. like it is not not fucking good man <laughs> yeah i mean this is her worst nightmare They're probably fine right because <laughs> you think in your head like she's probably thinking in her head this is what it's going to be like but at the same time you're like that's not going to happen like calm down it's not you're the city's not going to fall apart <laughs> You're being around. Uh, yeah, but then she gets off the... And it's literally her worst... It's got to be her worst nightmare, mm-hmm. I assume. Everyone's starving on the streets. Viego has, they mentioned, he sold everything. They're massively in debt. Camavorce destroyed long before <laughs> the ruination <laughs> happened yeah. here. And I do love the description of, like, how he lost it, too. Just because, like, he... He let a few charlatans in who were like, yeah, I can cure her. Then oh. word got around that he would just give fucking anyone yeah. money if you just pretended yeah. to be able to cure fucking her. Yeah, <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow showed up with goop and she was like, I got this. <laughs> Have you my, tried one of my candles? My mineral, <laughs> some mineral it smells oils like here. vagina. Yeah. It's, mm, it's the only thing I don't buy is that no one barged into the castle or killed Viego, especially because the Iron Order was sent away. Was all the Iron Order sent away? Some of them had to still were, be there, were, right? They were actually, the Iron Order specifically was like, were, were acting as guards in the oh, okay. palace. Okay, okay, now un, I remember. Unheard okay. of beforehand. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, if that it, makes sense because I was like, there's no way no one would have been like just fucking annihilated Vega. Like, dude, this queen is dead. You've completely run our country into the ground. Like mutiny, right? Yeah, I do like that moment yeah. where I think Callista is. I think her and Ledros are maybe like they, they're meeting again after she's come back, and she either says it or just thinks like, what do people f- like who are in the middle of a dying civilization think and feel? Do they yes. realize it's dying? Do they just go about their day? Like, is this it? Is this what it's like to see the death throes of this kingdom? It is like, yeah, it's- I gotta say, as an American, it was very relatable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was that was a really great moment. And she's just like she know she knows that it's over. Camo War is like done. Yeah, yeah. I am curious actually because we know how, um, we know how opportunistic Hecarim is. We know he's not above killing people if he thinks he can get away with it. We know that his ultimate aspirations are just kind of climbing the ladder for power. Yeah. He wants as much power as possible within Camivore. I'm very surprised he didn't uh, try to kill Viego, especially while Callista was gone. Because Callista was like probably the only way he was not going to get yeah. And, and I mean, obviously, he'd have to get through Ledros, which would be tough. But I imagine if he has the whole Iron Order, I mean, there's always there's already been rumors that the reason he leads the Iron Order, the the Iron Order, is because he killed the other leader. Like other of the Iron Order, probably aware this happened, but they're fucking cool with it because they get to loot shit, and that's what they want. Um, I do not think there would have been a lot of resistance if he was just like, hey, I'm going to go fucking kill Diego. <laughs> Are you guys down? And then we can keep looting like he's having us doing right now, but we don't have to lose literally all of the treasure that's in the vault because why do I care about protecting this yeah. kingdom that's fucking broke as hell? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is something they try and really emphasize is that Callista is kind of, his marriage to Callista is key to him having some sort of valid claim to the throne, but who gives a shit right like who right? is going to say hey my dude i know i'm a peasant who's starving because you, that guy closed the granaries uh and you killed them and opened them again but <laughs> can i see that birth certificate please right yeah yeah, yeah he could have easily gotten people on you yeah, that's a really good point john i, de- I definitely don't buy that hacker would have kind of stood by and just listened to a viego i think he would have really taken advantage of this situation, he, uh, Viego's gotten himself. He's the only thing standing between, I think, everyone coming in and tearing Viego apart anyway. Yeah. He wouldn't even have to go in and right? kill Viego himself. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> whoops, forgot a guard tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe if they did something more to establish it, like he was really manipulating Viego. Like, if I can keep him alive, yeah. he's much more valuable alive because then I didn't, yeah. all eyes are on him and I can kind of run from the shadow, like run <clears throat> the place from the shadows. It could be interesting, but I do agree. It doesn't yeah. make a ton of sense i think they just wanted him to they really wanted him to to be just so <laughs> mischievous he's like mm, i'm going to marry callista <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. now uh we get another conflicting uh account of how this happened when um they have the whole scene in the well uh, where with Viego and Isolde after she's dead and he puts her in the waters of, of life which this is by far my favorite version of how this happened because I think <sighs> I've always kind of wondered the way they've always described it is like he put her dead body in the water and through some magic it's been described a few different ways through various <laughs> magics it's in here so or the vague. potency of the magical <laughs> yeah. artifacts shit went wrong and now shadow isles yeah. um but i really like what they did here so they established early on that the sword that viego carries will suck your life force out and they also established that the the waters of life will heal you so when isolde turned into her wraith form and then stabbed viego with the sword there was like a magical battle where the waters were trying to heal him at the same time as the sword was trying to suck his life essence out. And the two of them were just battling against each other. Meanwhile, the world rune was like at the bottom of this well, just like, all right, I'm going to suck in some powers and win this fight. And then just <laughs> fucking exploded everything. Yeah. It was great. I liked it 
way more. I like I don't need a lot of practical explanation for how magic works, but I like a little bit, and this did it for me. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, um, you know, this is a really good example of I, we complain a lot of times in various lore pieces about uh, the yada 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 vagaries. <laughs> um, this is really all you need, like just a couple of ideas that are you know put into the story early, and then they come together in a nice like, oh, he's stuck in a weird, crazy, magical death loop, <laughs> and shit's right? going fucking haywire. Makes sense. Loved yeah, it. Yeah. It's great. And Easel being the one to cause it is really great too. I I mean, she she really kind of causes the ruination. I mean, we and I, I really like that idea. I mean, this is Viego's fault. We keep like joking around <laughs> and pointing blame. This is all Viego's fault in the end. Um wh- whoever led him here, whatever. He's the one who's fucking up. But if the if Easel just didn't stab him <laughs> like this wouldn't have happened uh, but at the same time you're like i don't blame you girl i don't know <laughs> like <laughs> you gotta do it but yeah her whole like she comes back and she's like i was at peace i like i had seen the other side why the fuck am i here are you kidding me <laughs> right like she thought she had escaped and then she did not and that is oh that's so devastating that and, is a tragedy and then like seeing that and then the bit we get to see of her at the end of the Sentinels of Light event, too, where she gives, like, another very similar speech, was like, my dude, again? <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought we had this conversation already. I'm so sick of being here. <laughs> Fuck off, here. Diego. I genuinely hope after Rise of the Sentinels, if we can get anything, Izzy's old at peace now? Has she moved on? Is she okay? No, she's stuck in the can doll. She- <laughs> Or some shit. I don't know. Honestly, that's not bad. Uh, no, you did make it sound like she was fucking the doll, which <laughs> she's fucking the Hello? doll. Hello, um, I'm stuck again. Uh, I need help. <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, no. yeah, that was all. That was all great. <clears throat> Frankly, that also makes uh, Callista's fate a little more tragic because we do see a bit of a moment where it seems like she's moving on to the afterlife, and and she's yep. in this kind of warm, glowy peace. And then, like, her, her need for vengeance kind of... Or I guess that and also the ruination. That's the big thing. Yeah, it's the ruination <laughs> first. If she had died, a, like, fully died, I think, a little bit earlier, she would have been okay? Is that know. kind of what the, we can understand? Well, I'm that, not sure. It probably... I, I don't know. That's a good question. But they say that all of, like, the, the 50 soldiers she had with her were all ghosty. So mm. I imagine, like, oh, true. recent... It's like they zombies. They had died earlier. Recent death, kind of. Any yeah. bodies there, probably. Yeah. Maybe their souls no were all nearby. Kindred Kindred was trying their best, man. They were <laughs> trying to get to every single one. There were too many. Like, well, I was like, I was five minutes away. What the fuck happened? Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I also do... Uh, as bef- A little bit before... Uh, Isolde is brought into the waters. Grail has a moment where he's kind of questioning Viego's sword, and you realize it's because he really wants it. <laughs> but he kind of realizes that it's soulbound, it wouldn't work, and he's like, oh, okay. Viego's like, why are you asking all these questions? He's like, oh, no, nothing. No reason. No, no reason. Never mind. It's cool. You're it's the cool. waters. You want to go? Probably put Scythe away. Like, no, no reason. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do like that Grail's like, huh, I should, I should just kill him. But I want to see what happens when he puts this dead bitch in those waters. Yeah, no, <laughs> right? you're so right. It's so great. And I bought it to 100%. Grail is just like, I. he, he could have. He could have killed him. And he's like, I'm just kind of, I just fucking want to see what happens. And he really won in the end. He came out on top here. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Took him a little while, but. He turns in. No, even just at the end of this. I mean, he turns. Oh, yeah. we, we hear him get turned into Thresh. He becomes Thresh here. In fact, as they say. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a thresher they had sneered they made him what he was and now they would suffer the consequences of their arrogance and petty cruelty Erlock Grail is dead he hissed now there is just thresh and it had big no longer thresher now thresh <laughs> yeah. yeah I was thinking that too yeah oh man so I got a long note here. Oh yeah, this was like my this was my end of book. Oh okay. Note, uh, mm-hmm. just random things. I liked. Oh yeah, this is an example of like the icons. Like that's like the, uh, um, the you know the rise runes and stuff. But mm-hmm. I liked the use of icons to shift character perspective. I thought that was really nice. Sure. Really made it clear whose voice you were getting at any given time, um, which is always really good. I uh, just heard the voice. Yeah, even easier. <laughs> <laughs> um. John has 
John writes <laughs> the tiniest, tiniest little font ever. And I make fun of him for it. And he's like, no, it's perfect. And then I just watch you with your old man eyes have to hold the book up to your face. <laughs> you I don't really have out. to hold it up to my face. It was just for, it was just for theater. Uh, I don't buy it. <laughs> anyway. The episode script is actually in that book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was worried Callista would be betrayed by the host. Knowing they were poor and Hecarim had money, uh, a betrayal could have happened. That's within the realm of possibility. Uh, especially with all of the um, spears in her back that we know are there. <laughs> um, but uh, I like how they ended up doing it. Although I feel like I kind of would have liked... It. I mean, it was it was good kind of showing loyalty and everything, but like... I feel like it kind of would have made sense if her people had betrayed her at the end there. Like, I feel like Hecarim made a big deal of saying, like, no, like, your people aren't even getting paid. Like, the only reason they're getting any money is because I'm paying them yeah. with the gains from <laughs> me That would have been shit. great. I, 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 I agree. Yeah. Um, I agree because when you read the Callista story, it feels way more impactful and kind of all of a sudden. That, like, she thought yeah. things were one way and then the world shifts. And next thing she knows, her and Ledros are bleeding out. And that's a lot more impactful than this kind of extended last stand fight sequence again very garen first shield um and it doesn't have the same impact you never really feel a betrayal at any point and, no yeah. no so really what happens is she she knows hecarim is evil when she's still alive and then he's like oh i'll tell you what we can still win and i'll him, spare ledros yeah, or something she's got like him that. at spear point they have beaten him she's got him at spear point right but yeah. you, know, you were saying I was yeah. just like giving context and for she, it yeah no no you're right and she agrees to it and then is like I'm sorry Ledros we love each other but I must wed him and then he stabs her and I'm like oh no <laughs> I'm a Callista it, 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 it doesn't work for me at all it was just it really really doesn't work fucking Callista being stabbed by the people she's been giving orders to this whole time who have followed her loyally uh, for years oh that's so much more de- because hecarim bought them oh my god yeah. that is great yeah. that would have been devastating and i would have bought her becoming this vengeful spirit yeah because she be she you know she's warm she's at peace the ruination happens she gets up ledros finds her and she's like ledros oh my god i can't believe this happened to us this is devastating and then she's like betrayal <laughs> <laughs> she suddenly turns into this you know the vengeful wraith that we know her as but i also didn't really by that i think anthony reynolds did his best here yeah but i i i didn't see any other big betrayals in her life we're just told she's like oh and then she thinks of all the other various betrayals of her life and i'm like thanks what the fuck are they and and hecarim stabbing her you knew he was evil girl like it just it none of it worked i think this was my least favorite part yeah of and everything changed it just doesn't fit i completely agree had the most potential too the line <laughs> had the most potential it really it really does the line specifically is he would betrayed her of course he'd betrayed her. <laughs> no she, she even shit. knows. Yeah. <laughs> it even says in the text, like, she, she even even she's like, Callista, you dumb bitch. <laughs> right? She even knows she fucked up. So why does she become this vengeance wraith? It doesn't make sense. But, oh, God, all of her people turning on her at Especially once. because they teased. Like, I thought they were teasing it. <sighs> I, think it I, right. I thought we were so getting that breadcrumb. I think you're really <laughs> so right. So good. It's, that's really smart. And you know what else? Is that something that's, like, been kind of a through line, um, at least from the, from, from the start? In that very first, like, chapter, she's really proud of the host. And she really holds them up as, like, look, they're not nobles, but they can be forged into something really good and reliable. And it not it, like, oh, God, isn't it fucking poetic? Man, John, you have fucking you have uh, nailed it so fucking right. hard. Yeah, I think you're right. He was kind of no. he was stuck, right? It's you want that, you know, that red wedding moment where like it all just happens so quick and you just it just comes out of nowhere and you just feel like this wrench in your gut, like oh god, oh no, um, but it doesn't ever happen, you know. <laughs> it's true, yeah, and and I think there there could have been a great moment where Callista doesn't even quite realize she's been stabbed or who has stabbed her it's quite literally in the back and and seeing that ledros has been attacked at the same time she could even have a moment like is ledros a part of this oh my god has ledros betrayed me and then she sees that ledros is also dying because he is also because they couldn't buy out ledros and they knew it or that could have been why 
why Hecarim doesn't try to buy out Ledros. He sees that Ledros is going into Callista's room. We can mm. have that moment. Mm, <laughs> like, the payoff. So yes. that payoff to him seeing Ledros going, and he's like, oh, well, you know what? Well, fuck you both then. I'm going to buy your entire army and have them stab you both in the back. Fuck you guys. We could have gotten a payoff uh, for Chekhov's booty call. <laughs> How long ago did you think of that? <laughs> just just now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what makes me so bad is that you're right. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a Chekhov's booty call, like 100%. <laughs> and I, I, one other thing frustrates me about this, too. We talked about how Thresh is way more I want to share this as Chekhov's booty call on it now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we talked about how Thresh was way more interesting to read because he's got a way stronger character mm. voice. They, I feel like uh, Callista's voice suffered because a lot of the time that we're in her head is dedicated to reinforcing the fact that she's very good at what she does. Yeah. Like all of her head is like, analysis and training and and taking in the world around her and um having her and that's like a sacrifice they made i think maybe it was intentional but like me like you know she won't be as interesting but people will know she's very very capable um and then having that all kind of go out the window <laughs> right at the very end she's like all right i my my training over the years has showed me that I can't trust you, so I'm not going to. But instead, being like, eh, okay, yes, <laughs> I guess we'll do this, and then I don't know. It, it it threw away a lot of groundwork that they had made a lot of sacrifices to set up. Yeah, I I, I really agree. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I wish I could go back and read through the specific lo- like try and follow the logic train. Um, because it's supposed to be something about like she will agree to what it's weird that she would even agree to wed like even that you would trust that he wouldn't kill you let alone that but then you would then still also agree to marry him when at this point it's really well established that she and ledros do have like a s- affection for each other and she and he's right there like i mean yeah. <laughs> the guy is <laughs> technically mortally wounded but you know i don't know it's 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 a hard thing to to really follow and i don't know Maybe it would have been better to just abandon the Hecarim betrayal altogether. If this is the way you're going to execute it, I don't know. Yeah. The last note I had was kind of just like a combination note between Ruined King and this. Like, Actually, I guess it's mostly Ruined King stuff. <laughs> I, I, I still had a plot question about Ruined King. Where like at the end of the game, you trap him in a pendant. Um, but it seems like he gets out real fucking quick, and I don't know how that happened. Could he trap an appendant? Viego? Viego. Oh. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like, I think implied in, I think maybe some postgrad stuff that maybe Pike had something to do with it. Oh, really? But they, they don't really explore it at all or, like, get very specific with any of it. So, like, unless I miss something... Hit, I mean, hit us up in the comments how the fuck Viego get out of that pendant and start <laughs> the, the whole Sentinels of Light shit which which seems to have happened very quickly after the events of the game because uh, misfortune I feel like the, the, the wound is fresh with all the shit that Gangplank is doing and she immediately sold her soul to Viego so I, I feel like it's a matter of like a week or some shit before mm-hmm. all the good you did in that game was undone yeah. and I don't know if I missed up that someone explain this to me what the fuck happened well the Riot marketing team said <laughs> <laughs> no I agree I think I said it during the Ruin King episode that we did that um I just I can't even regard it as like a a direct like lead into Rise of the Sentinels. They're just the, the handoff is so poorly managed that's like it's just its own separate thing. You kind of can't regard yeah. it with a lot of scrutiny. Um, I don't know if I have much which else, is, which isn't going to go well for them trying to establish these games as canon. Yeah, well, you know, a, a, a bit, I stumble out the gate. Maybe we'll we'll get better luck with like Mage <laughs> Seeker and things of that nature. Very excited for Mage Seeker. Mm, yeah, don't let me down. Um. 
The only other thing I was going to mention is I do like the moment where I'm pretty sure it's Yorick kind of shows up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I like that because it did play, like, even though I know what's going to happen, like you're saying, there was a little moment. It's like, he does seem to get through to Viego, and Viego does actually start to kind of accept what's happening and start grieving. I was like, oh, yeah. interesting. How is this going to change? And it was nice to see then Thresh um, kind of come in and fuck everything up. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Nice. <laughs> Neat. It was it was great. That was a that was definitely a moment to add to the angst and the devastation of it. As Vic was literally about to go back home, mm. like right? he was about to accept all this and go back home. And Erlock Girl was like, Mm-mm, "No, sir, I want to see what happens when you put that dead bitch in the water." <laughs> <laughs> I worked really hard to get y'all here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that was good. Yeah, there was a couple. There's a mention of Maokai as well. Very quickly. Um, Callista kind of sees him through the trees. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Yeah. yeah. When yeah. she's doing her little walk around the yeah, ground. she's just like walking around. She kind of sees Malachi like, sl- like slinking around. And then he's like, oh no! Someone <laughs> saw me! He's cute. like a toy from Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> he just stands. You just see these big eyes in a tree like... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this place is weird. I'm going home. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I don't care if it was fan service. I was like, oh, I know him. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's Malkai. <laughs> the tree. I'm a genius. <laughs> the tree. I, I know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> Zillion gets mentioned. That's one of the ways they find the place is Zillion keeps really. Oh, really? Really verbose notes about like everything apparently um and that's some of the stuff that oh, Diego man, was looking over that. yeah he gets like he gets like name dropped twice and that's it and they, i think they even say his name wrong the first time so it's you know <laughs> oh, okay a little little yeah. wink z dog <laughs> <laughs> <Z-dog. laughs> this is no time z dog <laughs> i'd love if that's how he signs his name <laughs> canonically <laughs> oh shit yeah well that's it yeah that was ruination a league of legends novel i i want i definitely want more novels we definitely picked apart this a lot and i i feel a bit bad because i don't think anything in reddles did a bad job or anything we're just kind of here to pick apart things and (laughs) um i I just feel as a fellow writer i don't like picking apart other novels i feel uh, guilty (laughs) lalore is one thing but but a book is another. That's fair. I think um the, yeah. I think if I I was probably harsher on this than like Garen for Shield, and I think it's because at least in my mind I came into it like it's a novel. I came in with maybe some different expectations than I did for like a novella. Yeah. Um, and maybe if I had lower those a bit, I might have enjoyed my time a little more. It's not bad. If, you're, <laughs> if you like League and you're just kind of interested in these characters, you'll probably enjoy it. Or if you want a nice kind of light fantasy type of thing, yeah. pretty easy read. Pretty, it's pretty mm-hmm. easy to get through. It's very easy. Yeah. It's a very easy read. Um, and I walked through life with no expectations. <laughs> so this was right in my wheelhouse. But yeah, there were there are things that I wish they hadn't changed, and things I'm glad that they did. Um, there are some great scenes in it for sure. I I think it could have been a lot better, um, just with more more time dedicated to some of the characters, like Linker in it. Don't worry. Don't be afraid to make the novel too long. You were. You are dedicating yourself to a full-length novel. Dedicate yourself mm. to it, man. Let it be a long novel. It's fine. I, 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 if you want to reach out to other fantasy writers, they're reading, like, 900-page books constantly. <laughs> like, trust me. They do not care. Yeah. It makes me wonder how much of that, like... I'm curious how much Riot was involved in, like... Like, here are the, here yeah. are the guidelines. Like, it can't exceed this length. Like, it has to kind of move at this I, pace. I am curious, yeah, if... um if he had gotten a restriction on the because i i can imagine that being very difficult yeah if he had to hit um a certain word count keep it under a certain word count yeah and i know like riot's lore team in general has had like a, a spotty past with you know just like their the kind of revolving doors and and uh you know just uh not being given the resources they need or like people from outside the team feeling like they should have more input then they really should on mm. the thing. So I can see that. I mean, I don't know if any of that was involved here. Maybe they've evolved over the years, but um I feel like my my guess here, I think this novel's under a hundred thousand words and that he was told to keep it under a hundred thousand words. Um, which for a fantasy, I think that's unnecessary. Fantasy should be over a hundred thousand not they, no, not so true. They should they don't they don't have to be. But in some cases they absolutely should be. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um but with all that said, what do you guys want a full-length novel about in the whole League universe? Oh, shit. If you could have a full-length novel. This is hard, because I feel like I have a lot. 
Okay. That I would like. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of things that I've said, man, I really want to see this. Uh, I would like... I would like... Um, I want okay. Uh, pull the trigger on some on some Alistar team up. Get him and Riven tooling around in Noxus. <laughs> um, have them do a little globe trotting with one or two other characters. I remember like maybe Rel, maybe Cled. <clears throat> get them all together. Do some shit in Noxus. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I like I like that idea of having a full length novel about something that hasn't. It's not a story that's already been told a bunch of times, right? You're kind of picking a few characters that have some lore and creating your own story based on that. I think that would be a really good idea because then they wouldn't be so confined to, you know, what's going to happen mm. or what has already happened, yeah. especially with Alistar. Nothing's happened. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's so per- perfect. <laughs> There's nothing there. <clears throat> I would, I would read a full length novel, which is a picking up of wherever Diana and Leona are. Oh, that'd be great. Um, Because I have a lot of questions about both of them. (laughs) I'm interested. I have a lot of interest in aspects in general in their interaction with hosts over time. Um, So I, I would love a novel exploring, especially after reading like the very good Pantheon short story. Like I want a novel exploring more about the relationship between aspects and their hosts in a different situation and the relationship between you know two hosts who knew each other before the aspects took over and like and also what they're doing with their storyline because i feel like those two in general we often have a lot of questions like well where the fuck was diana for this where the fuck was leona for this so like I'd read that one. <laughs> well, then you'd have to put Rise of the Sentinels in that novel, because apparently Diona decided to show up. for. She came uh, out of hiding just for that. Can we just not? <laughs> can we pretend? <laughs> I'm with you, though, John. I, I would prefer a continuation rather than a prequel. Um, I'd like some Bilgewater shit. I mm. want to know what happens when Gangplank makes himself known to be alive in Bilgewater again. I think that would be really fascinating. <clears throat> and because I, I, I mean, uh, does that happen in the Ruin King? I guess. Um, so th- what we get of Gangplank in the Ruined King, he's still kind of operating in the shadows. Mm. He is. I mean, he's the reason that Viego gets re-released. Is Thresh also tricks him? Mm-hmm. Um, does Miss Fortune know he's alive? Miss Fortune knows yeah. he's alive. Ah, oh, damn! What a Miss bummer. Miss Fortune That's captures him and is Aww. going to execute him, but he escapes before the end of the game. That's stupid. Okay, well, ignore that <laughs> and give me a novel, because <laughs> then we can get Graves and TF in the mix. I'd like them to be oh, some yeah. characters in it, and I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, or I think another region that lends itself to it is the Freljord. I like uh, Ash and Sejuani shit a lot. How they are very similar in a lot of ways and in another another world they could be really 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 close friends but they're just they're on opposite ends here of of a fight and if you have to do a prequel i would take the three sisters from the frail york oh That's sure true. i think that would be really fun yeah that's i get some void shit in there oh, oh yeah oh hell yeah I'm, that'd be great i, I, I would so. love a good void story mm-hmm. yeah that's not in shurima I, I would like to get away from shurima and void stuff for just a little bit feel, yeah. feel a little shurima I, out i don't know why but i find the void being in the freljord way more interesting <laughs> i'm not sure what it is <laughs> that lissandra story was pretty cool the one where they go down into <sighs> it into the Howling Abyss. Yeah. Yeah. it was a really neat depiction oh that's of fantastic it. yeah having that worked into a full-length novel could be really great it's very the thing, Aww. almost, or it could, it could be in Ooh, some ways, yeah. you know, some mm-hmm. of the way they talk about it. Maybe that's why I like it. And it's got a great opportunity for cameos. <laughs> it's true, honestly. Get a, lot of a, get a lot of champions in on that shit if you commit to a Void story. Yeah, I definitely like the idea of something taking place more in more in the modern, I guess, Runeterra, rather than ancient Runeterra. I don't know. This takes place a while ago from the present Ruterra that we have, right? Is yeah. it thousands of years? Yeah. It feels that's, like it, yeah. It's fucking a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there's an interesting story to be told from a celestial slant, too. Yeah. It wouldn't be my thing, much in the like that, that, that this wasn't. Um, but I would Obviously, I would still read it because we'd have to do an episode about it. <laughs> but it wouldn't be my thing. Celestials and gods, that's another thing that, mm, no. like Much like kings and whatnot doesn't interest me that much i think the aspects are a good a good grounding way like a good way of grounding yeah. all that the celestials are hard because yeah. they're so they're such a vague 
amorphous concept. Um, even I don't quite know what the fuck is a celestial versus an aspect versus. I don't think Riot you know, does. Yeah. I think that's maybe why I'd like a story on it. Mm. But I also like the idea of. <clears throat> I, I like in general in stories the idea of gods being, um, either beaten or controlled by mortals in some way. Well, I got have, a book right for found you. Actually. A way to, mm. Um. But so, like the whole thing with Aurelian Soul, like I kind of dig that that vibe. Sure. One okay. of my one of my favorite series growing up was the Avatar series, um, which is not to be confused with Last Airbender or the Avatar movies. There's just a, a series called um, the Avatar trilogies that was very good. Very I not heard of this. No. It was there was a two Avatars was enough. This is <laughs> third one. Uh, it's a trilogy of them, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, a lot about gods and how they're they've they've gone done fucked with mortals one too many times and they're gonna get theirs. <laughs> I'm done with that. I'm done with a little god killing. <laughs> that's what my that's what <clears throat> you know how sometimes when I'm playing an RPG I name my character Cyric. Oh, he's from, he's from that. He's from the Avatar trilogies. Oh, nice. He's Are a these really books? he's a really cool assassin thief. Yeah, they're books. Oh, okay, interesting. All right, well. That was Ruination, a League of Legends novel. Any final thoughts? No. no. I think we said it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> we have a Twitter. It's at Loreheads. And a Discord as well if you kind of want to pop in and talk to us. We have a Twitch, twitch.tv slash Loreheads. We generally stream on the weekends. We did miss last weekend. Um, John, Yeah, Sally. <laughs> it was kind of busy. That happens sometimes. <laughs> John does TFT for a bit. And then we'll jump into some uh, ARAMs. And we'll uh, all play together if you want to jump in as well. What other social... Oh, YouTube. Uh, we've been posting full-length videos of these episodes as well as clips that John uh, posts there and TikTok and whatnot. We have a Patreon as well. We just recorded Helmet Bro, <laughs> so that should be up really soon. <laughs> That's a bonus uh, audio episode. Uh, thank you so much to all of our patrons. But a very special thank you to our Madarda tier patrons. Big Man Gnomes, Chloe Things, <coughs> King of Hearts, and Techno Robert. Uh, if if you guys were on the Blessed Isles when shit went down, I would rise alt you to safety. Oh, mm. no biggie. Would you feel the sand beneath your hands or whatever it is he says? <laughs> Oh yeah, he said that's what he did. I, I honestly really liked how they had some Arise's abilities there. He like rude prison someone at some point. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. All right. Well, please be sure to join us next week. Uh, I think we're gonna have a lot to talk about because she just has a lot of lore as we talk about the exile Riven. Back to the Sentinels of Light. No, no, oh, no. I forgot she was in it. Are you kidding me? Why would you fucking do that, Raven man? Raven was in that. Raven's in that. I fucking no, she's not. Not in my universe. <laughs>